Right. Okay, first sign. Oh, so I think I recommend uh, for you to go back and review uh, the other sessions videos, which you can access on the AMO uh, website for CPD part. I think someone from AMA can drop that uh, during our session. So it's your first time. Yeah, for most people, I can see that. Okay, for the interest of time, I think we can start now. So since um, I think most of you are clinicians uh, here and we all are interested in writing uh, an article based on our uh, clinical observation. So the most important part of writing our paper is uh, uh, like having a, a clear result and being able to forward uh, a good or result-driven recommendation so that it can be used as an input for, uh, to guide our uh, clinical uh, okay, to guide our clinical practice or to be part of further evidence generation. So today we're going to see result-driven discussion and recommendation. Uh, this is simply how we define research. Research is a systematic collection, analysis, and interpretation of data to answer a certain question or solve a problem. So every research starts with a question or a problem, and we have to design a way to answer that problem. That means we write a proposal. And to implement the proposal, we need data, and we have to be able to collect our data systematically in a way that can make our life easier when we do data management and analysis, and in, in a way that's adherent to uh, the acceptable ethical standards of the country and also internationally accepted standards. After we get that, we analyze our data. That means we get results. And after we get our plain results, we have to interpret them, contextualize them. We have to give them a meaning so that we can apply the results. So when we talk about discussion, conclusion, and recommendation, we're talking about interpreting our results and applying that into practice, identifying uh, what we have found from this research and what can be applied to the current practice. So uh, this is simply the definition of research. Since we're going to talk about result-driven discussion and recommendation, let's, uh, let's say a few things about results. So Every research starts with a question. So based on our research question, our objective will be defined within that context. And based on our objective, we have to select uh, the proper analysis methods for both for the descriptive and the inferential. And based on the analysis, we get our result. And this result will define our discussion, conclusion, and recommendation. So this is very important. Uh, whenever you write an article, make sure that everything has a flow from the very beginning to the end. If you change your research question, everything is, else is going to be uh, changed. So you have to make sure that everything is in line with each other. So our result is uh, objective driven. And uh, the rest of uh, making meaning out of our results, the process of making uh, meaning out of results, which is our discussion, conclusion, and, and recommendations are also uh, result driven, which is indirectly objective driven. So. Uh, Maybe to give you an example, let's say we have a research question that is interested in, in, in studying the prevalence of MI among hypertensive patients. So this is our question. When you change it into an objective, you can say that we want to determine the prevalence of MI among hypertensive patients. Uh, and uh, you can make it smart by adding the location and the time period and other factors. After that, you have to be able to pick the proper analysis method. So to find the prevalence, what we do is simply we calculate a uh, proportion. That means we uh, can count the number of total number of AMI cases and we divide them by the total number of study participants and we multiply it with 100% and we will get our prevalence. So uh, we are going to use proportion or prevalence estimation as an analysis method. And let's say we get a result of 6%. So discussion means what does this 6% mean? We have to attach a meaning to this 6%. We, we're not just interested in the number, rather we want to know, we want to understand what this 6% means in the context of a number of factors. So this is what uh, the process of uh, arriving at your result is based on your research question. Uh, as you remember, or you can go back and refer, there are like four 
uh, webinar series on data analysis uh, for each label and step. Uh, to give you just some idea, there are three levels of data analysis. The first one is after you obtain your data, there are th three things that you can do. Uh, so the first one is describing your data. That means characterizing your study population. And when you characterize your study population, you have to consider all variables. That means both the exposure and the outcome. Uh, so you have to be able to give uh, a like description of the study participants in terms of their age, their gender, their place of residence, their symptom, their clinical presentation, uh, their laboratory values, many other factors in their outcome, which could be their, it could be uh, whether they're like recovered or died, or uh, it could be their length of stay, or it could be their, whether they have developed complication or not. So everything, uh, every variable on which we collect data has to be described in this section. And this is not an option. This should be presented for each and every type of research in both qualitative and quantitative. This is universal. Uh, data analysis step. Every research has to start with describing the data so that we can have a context of what kind of population was studied so that the rest of the result can give meaning based on the, that uh, population characteristic. So for this, we use descriptive analysis methods, which again, you can go back and refer. And the second part of analysis that we can do is comparative analysis or comparing groups. So comparing groups is sometimes we might be interested in comparing uh, a group of study population based on their particular characteristics of interest. It could be based on their outcome or exposure. So that with the whole point of comparing groups is especially when we're doing uh, analytic comparative research designs, when we're using that kind of design like comparative cross-sectional design, case control studies, cohort studies, or interventional studies, we have uh, two or more groups. So in that case, we want to make sure that the groups are fairly comparable and they can be tested. So to assert, uh, to to make sure that these groups are comparable, we have to run some statistics and see if there's a significant difference in terms of their age, their gender, or other clinical parameters. So comparing groups is not something that we do all the time, but when we have analytic studies, we can do that. For this, we use inferential uh, statistical methods like chi-square, ANOVA, um, t-taste, um, and uh, like correlation and other non-parametric tests, which you can also access from the previous webinars. So the last uh, level of analysis that we can do is building relationship or identifying if some exposure fact variables are uh, responsible for the development of the outcome under study. So this is the part where we're mostly interested as clinicians because we, what we want to know is when our patient presents with something, we want to know what caused this problem. So this is a very critical uh, step in analysis, but we can only do these types of analysis when we have analytic research designs. Otherwise, with descriptive designs, we can't do uh, building relationship and to to get these types of relationship we have to do inferential analysis particularly regression analysis of different types binary logistic regression linear regression and so many other types of uh, regression models so uh, don't forget that there are three steps of data analysis the first one is describing your data which is mandatory for every type of research and depending on the, the nature of research, we can do comparative analysis and regression analysis so that we can answer our research question. Uh, so what does discussion mean? Simply discussion means uh, giving meaning uh, for our results. Our results are just simply numbers and that number has to be contextualized so that we can have a better understanding of that result so that we can intervene accordingly. So what are the contexts in which we can give meaning to our result? Uh, in the previous example, we said there are, uh, the prevalence of MI was like 6%. So what does it mean? How, how can we discuss it? How can we give it meaning? The first one is uh, we can uh, compare it with the established scientific facts that we know so far, like for the already known facts like evidence. For example, for some surgical procedure, uh, there might be some known risk of complication from some surgical procedure. And if we conduct a study and, and we, we discover that the rate of complication is more than expected, then that has meaning. I mean, we, we can comfortably say that a lot of people are complicating from the surgery than expected, so we should do something. So the first thing that should come to your mind is when we're discussing a result is, uh, are there established facts or evidences 
uh, with regard to this uh, number or associated factor. So that the first thing that we should compare with is some established facts. The second is um, in terms of policy. Uh, for example, if you're studying about vaccine coverage for a given condition, let's say COVID-19, and if the national targets uh, or the WHO target is to, to a coverage of like 80 to 90% so that we can prevent further infection spread and we can protect vulnerable population, and but if you conduct a study and we learn that only 30% of the population is vaccinated, then this is a small number. So when we discuss, we're going to say that given the current policy, uh, given the current national in, in international targets, the vaccine coverage in our country is small and it could be because of this, this factor. So when we're going to compare our results, uh, we have to contextualize them in terms of the current policy as well, whenever there is. And the other is we have to compare it with other studies. This is something actually um, that you are going to see uh, in many research as a preferred mode of discussing our results, but uh, it should not be given priority because uh, what the results we obtain could be completely different from what's already known. We shouldn't frustrate as long as our uh, procedures are correct, as long as our data is credible, and as long as we follow everything properly and we arrive at uh, a credible result, then we should feel comfortable. That could be um, the beginning for us to question uh, what's already known. We should not expect our results to align with every other research that was studied in the past. Well, if it aligns with other research that we already know, uh, well, it can be uh, an input for evidence as part of uh, reviews. As part of reviews, meta-analysis, systematic reviews, or umbrella reviews are based on the studies, single studies conducted so far. So if our study matches the other studies that are conducted so far, it can be used as a part of evidence, which is good. Well, we can say that, okay, this thing is... Uh, what we found is also in line with what's studied so far. So it means there is a chance that this thing is fact, or there is a chance that there is a cause effect relationship between these factors. But when we don't get that kind of result, we shouldn't frustrate because uh, in the past, we know that there are a number of studies uh, uh, which uh, demonstrated uh, a good or beneficial effect on some drugs. But uh, after uh, some years, those results are were like declared to be uh, like wrong or not efficient, and some drugs were banned from the market. So, uh, don't worry. As long as your uh, research is properly conducted, uh, we should not expect it to align with every other research result that we know so far. So, the most important part of describing our discussing our uh, results should rely on the above two, and actually we can put it like this, more emphasis should be given for what's known so far, established fact and the current policy. And after that, you can compare it with other research. But whenever you do these three things, there is one important factor that we should consider, which is the population characteristics. I mean, the number, for example, 6% MI, let's say what we expect from uh, MI from the total hypertensive patients from what we know so far is let's say 2% and we, what we get is 6% before we, we decide that this number is very high and we should do something about it. The first thing we should see is the characteristics of the study population because if the study population included uh, had like mo majority of them had like other additional risk factors, if they were old and if they had other um, factors that can make them be more vulnerable for MI, then it should not be alarming because this number is um, based on the studied population characteristics. So first we have to see if the study population characteristics is something that we expect considering the general population. So uh, whenever you um, discuss your results in the context of these three things, uh, always consider the population characteristics. We will see an article, so it might make more sense then. So what are the things that we can discuss? It should be based on our main results. So um, I want you to tell me, you can drop it on the chat box. Uh, so let's say uh, we have conducted study and we have uh, put every result, like starting from characterizing the study population up to building relationships. So which results do you prefer to discuss? 
let's see here. So for, for this example, we have, we have determined the prevalence of MI and we have identified significantly associated factors. And this is the result. So uh, from the characteristics of the study population, uh, we can see that uh, among the 600, 560 participants, 252 were males, 314 were from region X, more than half were adherent to medication, blah, blah. We can, this is how you describe your study population. The second thing that you, you should do is you, you should measure the outcome of the study. Even if it's part of characterizing the study population, it's worth mentioning separately. So we usually present the outcome uh, description separately so that we can give more emphasis and see it very well. And as we discussed last time, we have to present the results uh, with uh, upper and lower boundaries using 95% confidence interval or the other proper measurements. So let's say we have found a prevalence of uh, 6%. And the, the third thing that we can do is we can compare groups. If it is a case control or a cohort study, we can, co uh, we can compare between the cases and the controls or the exposed and non-exposed groups for a cohort and uh, RCT studies. Finally, we build relationship. We try to see if the, what are the significant factors that affect the development of MI among hypertensive patients? So in this case, we can get um, different results. Some of the results can show positive relationship. The others negative or uh, instead of negative, no, re no relationship. So um, let's say uh, from our regression results, we have found that old age being diabetic and poor diagnostic skill of the clinician leads to a higher prevalence of MI among hypertensive patients. So this is, uh, let's say briefly, the outline of our results. So which results do you want to discuss? Which results are worth discussing? Please, uh, let me give you uh, 30 seconds and drop your answers on the chat box. Anyone? I mean, we have four groups of results. The first one is we have characterized our study population, and then we have pre pre presented the magnitude of the problem. We we wrote that like MI six percent prevalence of MI six percent. We compared between groups. Let's say it was a case control study, and we have found that the cases and the controls are fairly comparable. There is no significant difference, so we're good to go to do further analysis. And on the regression analysis, we found that. Uh, old age, being diabetic, and poor uh, diagnostic skill of the clinician is associated with high risk of MI. And we have for the rest of the variables, like it could be gender or other factors, we did not get any significant relationship. So which results do you want to discuss? Okay, measuring the outcome, great. Great, so we, we all can agree that the, the outcome should be discussed. Mm hmm Great. The factors like the age of the participants and being diabetic should be great. You, but you left out uh, the third factor. Great. This is very nice, right? So um, the results that should be discussed are, should, are like our main results. Our main results indirectly means what was our research question. Our research question was we want to determine the prevalence of MI and we want to assess the associated factors. So from this result, our, our first objective is answered by uh, this result, right? So we measured the outcome of the study and we found 6%. So we have to discuss this result and then we want to assess or identify the significant factors associated with MI and we have identified three factors. So our discussion should be based on these uh, three associated factors and the 6% prevalence. Other than that, we're not interested in discussing about their detailed characteristics or the no relationship results or the neg negative means, I'm sorry, it might mislead you. It's to mean that there is no relationship. So we're not interested in discussing the other things. One of the quality of research article is uh, that uh, is being precise. So that comes when we are focused while we're writing our manuscript. So in our discussion, we're supposed to discuss only 
the mean results, which are based on our objective. So here we have to discuss the 6% confidence in, uh, outcome and the three significantly associated factors, because that's what uh, our end goal is by this research. So the other is what uh, the structure of our discussion session uh, section. The first thing that we can do is it's a, a common trend. You can also skip this part, but it's a common trend to present a summary of what was done, what was our objective, what uh, the sample size studied. And sometimes we can add the rationale of the study, but we have to make sure that this should this should be this should not be more than uh, three or four sentences. And the other is, as we said above, we have to discuss the main results and the flow of the discussion should be similar with the flow of the results section. As we said, the results section uh, follows uh, a presentation uh, that starts from the descriptive result and then measures the outcome and then compares groups and then finally builds relationship or runs regression analysis. So our discussion should be should also have similar flow it actually makes sense. We start with the magnitude of the problem is this much, and then the significant factors are this is. Even when we present the significant results, uh, if we started with age and DM and then uh, skill of the physician, then our discussion should also uh, follow the same pattern and starts with age, DM, and skill. This is like to make uh, our result more presentable and easier for the for the audience to read and understand it. It's not to create any complication or anything, or it doesn't have any uh, scientific relevance rather, to, to create a flow, uh, a smooth flow of present uh, result presentation. So the, the last one is we have to avoid confidence intervals. Sometimes uh, confidence intervals and p-values are not something that should be presented in our discussion section. For example, uh, we can say that uh, the odds of uh, developing MI among patients with diabetes is like uh, 3.25 times higher than those with no diabetes. But in our results section, we normally present the odds ratio result with 95% confidence interval and p-values. But in discussion, we were not expected to present these details. Rather, we can present the 3.5 times higher, and then we can explain what that result means. Otherwise, p-values and confidence intervals are not welcomed. Sometimes confidence interval for our outcome variable, uh, for example, 6% uh, prevalence of AMI with 95% confidence interval can be presented. But for associated factors, uh, we don't present that kind of 95% uh, confidence interval or p-values because it's not necessary. Uh, discussion has to bring something different than the result. Uh, it should not be a mere re repetition of our result section. So uh, the other thing is when we're discussing, we have to further contextualize our results in terms of its strengths and limitation of our study. This is something that should come as the last paragraph of our discussion section. And what are the things that can be considered as a strength and limitation of our study? Let me give you 30 seconds. And what are the things that you think should be mentioned as a strength or limitation of our study? Please drop your answer on the chat box. Okay, okay, sample size, okay, something, okay. Mm. Uh, I think it would be nice if you, if you can explain it further. Applicability, sample size, sampling, okay, what else, sampling, okay. Sampling, is it as a strength or as a limitation of our study? Generalizability, scope of the study, great, okay. The best thing we can do in any researches, okay, and in any researches uh, to make sure that we have designed it in a way that's feasible and acceptable so that the results that we can get 
can be uh, the best of what we can get given uh, the resources we have. So, um, so the what to talk about? The first thing is if it's a new study topic, for example, if it's a new st study topic, if there is no prior study on similar area, should we take that as a strength or a limitation of our study? So being a new study topic, is that our strength or limitation? So you are studying on something. Oh, great, limitation and strength, wow. Limitation and strength. Can somebody please speak? You can raise your hand and you can explain. We can make it more interactive. It's usually one-sided. Strength, both, okay, great. Okay. Can you explain why it can be considered as a limitation of our study? Uh, great, thank you. But we're talking about uh, a new research topic, something that has never been studied. So is that a strength or a limitation? Great, a HP, I wish, okay. The common question that I normally receive from my students is that when they are working on something new and when they couldn't find literature, they, they insist on changing their study topic or study area overall because they think it's a limitation of a study. Because it's, it's something good. The, what's the rationale? What, what's, uh, I mean, when you write your proposal, I'm sure you all wrote your rationale or justification for your study, right? The justification of the study should be like, what's a good justification for a given study? What is it that you write as a justification of your study? I personally read the justification of a study uh, as the first thing when I review an article because justification is the place where you learn that what this research is going to add from what we already know. So if a research is not going to add something new, if we are going to research something that's already studied, then there is no place for our study. It's not relevant. So having a, a new research topic is always good. That's what a researcher should do. In fact, I mean, we're not supposed to repeat similar studies. Rather, we should bring some novel ideas and we should study something that has never been studied. The fact that there is no prior study might not give us a broad perspective of how we can approach our problem. That can be considered as not a limitation, but uh, I mean, understanding what other researchers um, what other researchers have done, yes, before can give us uh, okay, that's good. Yes, I'm reading the the comments. Yes, if we have knowledge of what others have done in the past and what others have uh, understood, we can take their okay, so somebody raised a hand. You can speak. Please unmute him and you can speak. Uh, it's okay, great. Hello, everybody. Thanks so much. I think everyone can hear me. Thank you. Please go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I think for the question, I didn't understand very well. Just, uh, no, uh, I mean, I understand the question and on the other way, Danny. When you say the, when I say limitation, I thought uh, uh, when you try something new, every student or everyone who's new at this uh, to, to, to do this, they uh, be like, uh, you don't have the, uh, you know, literature review, you, you don't have uh, the documents or uh, that you can make, um, that can help you to do uh, this. Uh, that's why the person, don't cannot get the, the correct the correct to do things. So we usually see uh, um, as a limitation to do new 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 research. 
But in other in other way, as you say, if you try to do new research or you talk about new topic, it will be strengthened in your mind. You know, it gives you a, a, a power of to do something. It makes you, you know, proud when you try to do something new. But that's that needs more experience uh, to, uh, to make previous study. You have to make previous study, as I think. Sorry, my English is not good, but I, uh, I think you understand what I'm talking. Thank you so much. Very well explained. It's it's very nice. Yes, um, it's from. It depends on how you try to see it. So I mean, sometimes if we know that how other people have studied it, and uh, if what we have planned is let's say case control study design, and if we learn that that approach is not good because probably the exposure is rare, and we have to change our study design into a cohort, or if we originally planned a cohort and if it's not a good idea because the outcome is rare, then we have to change it. It will give you a lot of perspective having a prior literature, but just because there is no prior research doesn't mean we can't conduct research because all new research topics have to be conducted so that we can actually say that there are research, right? So we can be the first people to do those research. And, um, and it's usually taken as a strength of your study. Stud studying something new is, uh, yes, yes, thank you, thank you. I'm, you're seeing the no chat box, right? I'm trying to read that as well. So it's 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 seen as the strength of your study. That's what we're always trying to assure when uh, somebody conducts a study. What we are going to say is that no, this is well studied. You have to come up with some other new title. So coming up with a new study topic is always a good thing, and it's our it should be cited as the strength of our study. The other thing is methodological perspectives. So from the methodological perspectives, what we can talk about as strength and limitations are our design, the period of observation that we have made, and the variables addressed. So uh, in both, we can see this in both directions. For example, the study design that we used, if it is a simple descriptive study design, and uh, what we have learned about this new study topic is just the characteristics of the study participants, and if we can't make further inference about other uh, population characteristics and other factors, then that would be our limitation. So whenever we go up uh, high in the pyramid of uh, evidence generation, then it's a good thing. It can be considered as a strength of our study. If you remember, uh, there's this pyramid, then uh, at the bottom is case report and case series, and then cross-sectional studies, case control studies, cohort studies, RCT, and then when we go to this, these are for single studies. So uh, RCT is the gold standard study design for a single research because it will give us a more direct evidence of cause and effect relationship. So whenever you go high uh, up in the pyramid, uh, so your uh, study design becomes more strong in, into generating a good evidence uh, or sign of at least cause and effect relationship that can be taken as uh, the strength of your study, but the reverse can be taken as the limitation of our study. But uh, just because we have the resource and everything, we can't always do our cities or cohorts because of their own limitation. So what's important is for our research question, given uh, the resource that we have, the ethical considerations and the nature of the variables that we are studying, we should be able to to use the best design available so that it can be taken as the strength of our study. For period of observation, this is for when we're conducting cohort or charge review or uh, RCT studies. If we allow a good, a reasonable amount of time to observe our participants so that we can observe all potential outcomes, we can observe all the na natural history of the disease, then that can be considered as a good uh, a strength of our study, for example, uh, to see the complication of a given condition, a surgical procedure, for example, someone can make an observation for two weeks. If some other person uh, conducts a research that uh, makes an observation for up to three months, then this person will be able to pick both the acute and chronic complications 
long-term complications. So it would be a good research. You will have a better understanding of the natural history of the condition. So, and the other is the more variables we address in our research, it can be considered as our strength because uh, the true relationship, the pure relationship between two variables can be assessed uh, when we are able to control as many confounding variables as we can. So the more variables we control in our search, the more accurate result we get uh, uh, in, in, in assessing the relationship between our exposure and outcome variables. So, uh, so whenever we have limited variables, it's our limitation. And when we address a lot of variables, it's our strength. The other is what, uh, there's always a bias in any form of study that's intrinsic to the study design or the way we conduct the research. So nobody expects us to eliminate bias 100%, but what we can do is we have to be able to minimize it. And what we're expected to present is, uh, there are these, these potential biases in our study, but we have the, these, these, these things to minimize our bias, the bias. So this will be taking us our strength, but if we, we did not handle this properly, or if some of the biases cannot be controlled uh, by whatever design that we use due to probably ethical truths, for example, uh, if we're studying, if, if we're trying to observe um, some uh, practice, surgical procedure practice, um, and we can't make the observation for research purpose without informing the participant. So if we inform the participant, then that participant will be prepared and will follow every procedure correctly, every infection prevention practices. So it will be like something that not that person does on a regular basis. So it will bias our results because the person knows that we're observing him and he will improve his performance. So uh, we don't want to, even though we don't want to introduce bias, some of the things due to ethical issues can be uh, cannot be eliminated. So if there are such kind of conditions, we have to acknowledge that as a limitation. So the good parts um, in uh, stating our strength, the limitation is not uh, is not to make our paper more acceptable, but rather reporting the truth, the true strengths and the true limitation is good because every paper is known to have their own limitation. The most important thing is when we admit them, uh, a person who uses it for evidence generation, let's say someone doing a meta-analysis, will have a clear picture of uh, the limitation of our study. So we'll carefully assess our study and include it in further evidence generation. So there is no one to blame us. Rather, we have to be honest so that our paper can be a part of evidence in the proper way. So there are things that we should not refer to. The first, I mean, we should not refer to when we talk about strength and limitation of our study. The first one is sample size. There is, um, uh, we can see it in two ways. The first one is if the study is, if the problem that we're studying is well studied, if there is no scarcity of study population, the normal procedure, the normal expected principle is to calculate sample size using the proper uh, sample size formula, adding all statistical consideration and reaching to the proper final sample size. If we go through that process for, a disease condition that's not uh, rare, then that cannot be considered as a strength of our study. It's actually mandatory to go through that process. So for those kind of studies, we cannot present that. I have, let's say our sample size calculation formula gave us um, 980 uh, participants and we studied them. And we can say that I have included 980 participants as a strength because that's actually what's expected and that's what the formula gave us. But if we're studying rare conditions and due to the rare nature of the disease condition or due to the lack of evidence in the past because of limited number of uh, study population. And if what we know so far is like based on studies conducted on like um, few patients and if we conduct similar study in a relatively larger group of population where we don't even calculate sample size and we include everyone because of the uh, rare nature of the disease, then that can be considered as a strength because whenever our sample size increases, uh, the precision of our result also increases. So the strength of evidence that we generate will also increase with our sample size. So we can say that 
since there is no prior knowledge about the problem and there is scarcity of evidence, uh, what we studied, what in our study we have included a, a large number of population, which can give us a more precise result and that can be taken as our strength. But in a normal, well-studied uh, disease condition where there are a number of uh, participants and where we have calculated sample size, we cannot refer that as a strength of our study and the same goes for sampling technique. I mean, sampling technique is a choice that we make unless there is, I don't know, I, 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 when, you, when you write that as um, a limitation, I was trying to understand how, I mean, how you understood it. Uh, whoever said sampling technique as a strength or limitation of study, can you please explain? Because I, I want to learn, I want to understand your perspective as well. But from my side, sampling technique is a, it's a thing that we choose. And it's also, again, mandatory process. For example, in an observation, in a quantitative research, we cannot use purposive sampling methods <clears throat> uh, because uh, uh, we it's a it's a quantitative research are for generalization, and we have to use uh, probability sampling method. So we can't use purposive sampling in quantitative research. So that's that's also not acceptable. And within the probability sampling methods, if our data are lows, if the our sampling frame are lows, then we have to use the gold standard sampling methods like simple random sampling method. Or if it's not convenient, we can use systematic random sampling method. If we have different stages, we use multi-stage cluster and and so on. So how come uh, it can't be directly um, labeled as a strength of our study or limitation of our study? We have to use the proper. It's like a choice. There is nothing uh, to blame it on. We have to use the proper sampling method from the very beginning. Even during the inception of the research, we have to plan on using the proper sampling method. So it should not be referred as a limitation or strength of our study. and the other is response rates. Again, when we can calculate our sample size, we add non-response rate by considering the sensitivity of the subject matter and other factors. And this is also something mandatory and procedural, and it's not considered as a strength or limitation of study. So we should not uh, include these things as strength or limitation of study. So I, I think this is all about discussion. Uh, do you have any questions? Are you comfortable with what we have discussed so far? Oh, okay, so if you have any question, you can drop it on the chat box. Dr. Brooke will get to it and we can discuss at the end. So uh, when we come to conclusion, so when we present our discussion, always make sure to follow the structure, you can summarize, you can present a summary and then interpretation of the main results in the context of what we have discussed here. And then we have to avoid these things. And finally, we have to present uh, in the last paragraph, the strength and limitation of our study. So it's, uh, do not forget this. So in the conclusion of our study simply means a summary of our main findings. So here, we're not supposed to write just numbers, uh, because we have talked about the numbers on the result section, on the discussion section. Here, we'd rather present what the number means. Is it high or low, uh, considering the available evidence and policy? And if we don't have existing evidence and policy for some, the study, uh, the subject matter we're studying, for example, if it is a novel condition, then we can present the conclusion. Uh, we can give it a meaning in the context of other studies if available. If not, then we will be forced to just present the number. Uh, for example, if you are studying COVID-19, I was uh, a principal investigator for COVID-19 research, and there was no research in the country and even in Africa at the time. So it was very difficult to contextualize our findings in terms of what's available. So in those scenarios, we'll be forced to use the numbers, but whenever possible, give priority to give meaning for your research in terms of the available evidence and policy, or if not available, at least other comparable studies in similar setup or even in other setups. So uh, let's say uh, in our example, we have determined the prevalence of MI and identified associated factors. So uh, we said 6% prevalence for MI. 
So here, in conclusion, we're not supposed to repeat the prevalence of MI was 6%, but rather it's preferable to say prevalence of MI is high. Let's say 2% uh, was what's known so far uh, from different evidence. And if we find this number to be high, then we're going to say the prevalence of MI is high among the study population. And uh, these were the factors associated with high odds of MI. So it, it should be just, it should be presented in a sentence or two, just as a concluding remark for, to show the summary of our main findings. When we come to recommendation, uh, it's important to know that there is little we can learn from one study. Whatever it is, whatever uh, type of study design we use, uh, how, however, uh, it's conducted, the number of population, whatever, it doesn't matter because in one study, we can only learn a perspective of that studied population. We can't generalize, we can't change policy, we can't change anything. Uh, to, to change that, we have to um, look for further evidence and we, we have to be able to conduct reviews. Uh, we have to be able to collect similar other research conducted in different setups during different times and then combine the evidence, synthesize it and look if that evidence still exists in the reviews that we have made. So at that point, we can, we can change our practice and others. So there is little we can change based on one study. So we have to stay realistic because if you see a recommendation paper uh, for most master's students, uh, it's somehow like over ambitious. The study uh, covered only a few things, but the recommendations are like too much to the level that most people recommend changing policy, changing guideline, and uh, like even uh, I don't know, changing treatment practice. So which is like not acceptable with a single study. With, with a single study, we can only learn few things. And if we find a very interesting finding, then we should be able to do systematic reviews, meta-analysis by gathering evidence from similar setups from around the world and synthesize and find a solid evidence based on our reviews. So for, for our research example, uh, what we get are, we found that prevalence was 6% and the uh, important or significant factors were these three factors. So what do you recommend? Let's start with the first one. So we found that being old is associated with a higher odds of MI or it's a higher risk of MI. So what do you, what do you recommend for this? What do you recommend for this? There are modifiable and non-modifiable factors that we can study in each research, right? Uh, for example, if uh, poor exercise is a factor, we can say that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, if for poor uh, exercise is um, great, uh, if it is, uh, please read the chat boxes. Interesting conversation is going on. Uh, so if it is, for example, lack of exercise, then we can say that uh, these group of patients should start exercising, right? Some of the factors are not modifiable, like our age, our gender, other genetic factors, and others. In this scenario, what we can do is great. What we can do is we can arrange a more frequent follow-up, right? If our patients are like old, we can give them priority we can follow them uh, very strictly and we can um, implement more strict preventive strategies so that we can prevent them from uh, uh, developing MI, right? For example, in COVID-19 studies, it was demonstrated that older people are at high risk of developing severe disease and dying from COVID-19. So when due to scarcity of resources, when we get the first batch of vaccines, it was announced that uh, people who are 65 and older or those who are 55 and older but with comorbidity can get the vaccine, right? This is prioritizing high-risk population. So even if <laughs> we can't say them don't get old, right? So what we can do is we can give them preventive methods so that we, they can they can prevent complications. And if it, in a hospital setup, we can make their appointments more frequent so that we can uh, pick their uh, 
symptoms, early symptoms, and manage accordingly. So for DM, what we can uh, propose is uh, proper uh, control of blood sugar, right? So these are the things that we can do. And again, we can say that uh, we can recommend that this group of patients should be followed strictly too, right? So if someone, if just hypertensive, if we have just hypertensive patient, and if we have another patient with hypertension and diabetes, we can um, make the follow-up of the hypertension, the diabetic patient more frequent so that we can pick early symptoms of MI or uh, po potential uh, risk factors. So how about for this poor diagnostic skill? Let's say the, the patient presented to the ER early and uh, with poor with potential risk factors and symptoms were not uh, properly identified. Thank you, right? Here we can say that if what's demonstrated is, is really the poor diagnostic skill of the clinician, then what we can do is provide training for the healthcare professional. I brought this example on purpose because in most research, I don't know why, I think it's a convenient recommendation. Most people write trainings when they do not find any significant factor that shows that the outcome has happened because of lack of skill in some component. So unless we get a clear indication that uh, the outcome has happened because of a gap in knowledge or skill, we can't recommend training. So uh, when we recommend result-driven recommendation means all you have got to do is just write down the significant factors that you obtained from your regression analysis. These are the three factors, but probably we have, what we have run is like 10 or 20 factors, but we found only these three factors to be significant. So for these significant factors, we have to uh, sit down and write uh, targeted recommendations and that are realistic and uh, applicable in our setup. So we can write that we have to follow these patients, high-risk patients more strictly. We have to apply preventive strategies and we have to provide trainings for healthcare professionals. So for this, to say what kind of trainings, uh, how frequently uh, and other details, you can do need assessment based on a specific group of population. So the other issues, uh, in addition to uh, for which um, variables to recommend, what we can do is who would, uh, our recommendation can be targeted towards the institution or organization who can intervene. So who who can be uh, who can intervene in this uh, research and can bring change. So uh, don't be again be like realistic again because sometimes uh, there is a trend. Uh, of classifying our uh, recommendation, we usually put it as clinician, uh, regional health bureau, ministry of health, sometimes the application in original. <laughs> so uh, regional health bureau, ministry of health. I mean, if the, the study that we have conducted is among study, study population who are on follow up within these institutions, institutions which are like, um, laid by this, these uh, bureaus, then yes, they might use our input to change their practice. I mean, to guide their practice. Otherwise, we have to stay realistic. And the other thing is in any publication, in any journal, there is no recommendation section because a recommendation is like, it's, it's very difficult to recommend based on a single study, as we said. And what is, um, what, is uh, what, what you can do is you can add your recommendation uh, as part of your conclusion. So what we can say in our study is uh, the prevalence of MI is high among the study population and old age DM and poor diagnostic skills were found to be associated with high odds of MI. Therefore, we recommend a more strict follow-up for these high-risk patients and uh, provi providing trainings for healthcare professionals. So we don't even present it as a separate section uh, by indicating all uh, the stakeholders who should take part in the uh, in the implementation of the research. We have to be careful as a student research, uh, we're expected to write these things, but in uh, publication recommendation, uh, too far recommendation is not acceptable. And some even don't allow you to write any sort of uh, recommendation, even as part of the conclusion. So we should be careful while recommending. 
uh, our article. Uh, I want to show you one article. Mm. Uh, can you see this article? So this is an article on, you can see this page, right? Dr. Brooke, can you see this? Emma, anybody, can you see this? Okay, thank you. So this is a study on CAR-36 and outcome profile of hospitalized African patients with COVID-19, the Ethiopian context. This is one of the articles that we wrote. And just to show you um, the results, uh, here uh, we have presented the social demographic, clinical and laboratory characteristics of the participants and things learning status, it's partly survival analysis. So you have to present all the uh, study population characteristics, it's very important. And since we this is a novel condition, we did not calculate sample size, we have included all eligible participants because we want to learn more about the condition and we're not in a position to calculate sample size and uh, just uh, uh, remove the others because we're not, we, we can't say that the sample population has similar characteristics with the other population because we have no idea about the entire COVID-19 patients in our country. So we have included eligible 1,741 patients and among them 71 died. That makes the uh, prevalence of death 5.3%. So we have one 5.3% uh, death by proportion. And the other, we have assessed uh, factors that are associated with uh, clinical recovery. Uh, you might not want this. Yeah, so here we have uh, a, a table, regression table that shows the association of the exposure, these exposure variables with our outcome. And as you can see, um, uh, temperate fever and disease severity and having calf and these three factors were significantly associated with our outcome. And so our discussion should focus on, even if we have all these results, these are like uh, supplementary results, which we can use to further uh, characterize uh, or discuss our findings. But the main focus of the findings should be based on our outcome variable, the, the magnitude of the problem, which is the rate of death, 5.3%, and the significantly associated factors, as you can see here, uh, fever, COVID severity, and cough. So uh, there are two regression analysis. That's why I'm skipping the other. If you're interested, you can read this on your own. So um, the discussion section starts by uh, describing what we have done, how many patients we have included, and others. And we presented the uh, death rate since uh, this. We people want to see how precise our result is. Uh, we put the confidence interval for the outcome. Otherwise, we don't put confidence intervals, adjusted, uh, I mean, p-values for other results. So when we discuss our results, uh, I think you can read this paper. Uh, the link is on the slide as well. Um, the number was like high compared to some studies, and it was very low compared to another study. So before jumping to the conclusion that there is a high rate of days in our country or in our institution, we have to compare, we have to see the characteristics of the studied population. As you can see in this example, there was another study in Northern Ethiopia by the time this uh, study was published. So we have compared it with that. The days rate in that population was 0.8%, but in our study it was 5.3%. But we can't say that the days rate was high because first we have to compare the characteristics of our study population. In our study, uh, we had uh, a considerable amount of number of severe uh, patients, like up to 23%. But in the other study, they did not have almost like 4% uh, severe cases. So whenever you have more severe cases, the risk of death also increases. So considering that the study population in the Northern Ethiopia study was like uh, very uh, stable, asymptomatic patients, we don't even expect that there to be death, right? And on the contrary, with other, when we compare it with other studies, for example, like in New York and other uh, 
US countries, their death rate was very high, like up to 23% and others. But their admission pattern was geared towards admitting severe and critical patients. But in our setup, even mild, moderate, even asymptomatic patients were admitted. So before saying that our death rate is lower, then we have to explain that what, what we have studied is mostly uh, mild and moderate cases with up to a quarter of them uh, having severe disease. But in other setups, 100% of them were like severe and critical. So if you consider that, it, we can say that even the disease rate in our setup is higher considering that the study population was relatively healthier. So the characteristics of the study population is relevant in uh, contextualizing our finding while we compare it with other studies. And the other is uh, we can compare, we can when we present our study results, as you remember, the first one was uh, temperature, and then the second one was disease severity, and then lastly, it was cough. So we have followed the same uh, presentation flow, and we presented our finding, and we have uh, presented it in the context of uh, what's already known, why uh, having fever was uh, associated, what was its implication? Is it because it shows a competent uh, a, a body defense system or why was there uh, a significant association even for severity, for cough, for everything you have to present uh, the available evidence, support it with current policy whenever possible and compare it with other results. And when you do that before rushing into judgment, uh, to say that our result is good or bad as compared to the others, we, you have to consider the study population characteristics. If they were not comparable, we can't say that our uh, result is good or bad as compared to the others. So these are uh, some of the things that you can see. I think today's webinar is not more interactive because of uh, the nature of the topic. There is nothing to calculate or I don't know to do. The other webinars were more interesting. Um, uh, from my side, this is a support today. I can accept questions now. Uh, Dr. Brooke, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Y you can take over. And thank you, Dr. Stigas, for this wonderful presentation. Uh, we have uh, one question. Is it possible to compare finding from different population? Uh, and as an example, uh, yours and that of the Northern Ethiopia. Sure, uh, you, we can compare results. When when we compare results, what's normally said is that we have to compare them with the studies that are conducted in similar setups. The purpose is when it's a similar setup study, we expect the population characteristics to be comparable. So uh, we can fairly compare the results but we can even compare with studies conducted in a completely different setup where there is a different sociodemographic pattern, where there is a different healthcare system. But when we compare the results, we have to contextualize that in terms of those characteristics. For example, the New York study uh, in the US, the disease rate was very high, but we did not say that our population is not dying as compared to the US. We say that our population uh, only a quarter of them were severe, but those studies where we found up to 23% death rate, the study population was like entirely severe and critical. So considering that, I mean, the death rate is probably relatively lower if the population distribution was similar to us. So uh, comparison can be made with any uh, sort of setup, but we you have to explain those differences. And you have to consider that someone who's completely layman or someone who's who doesn't know uh, what we wrote as a professional can read our paper. And how do you explain it for that per person so that uh, the findings can give true meaning? So I think, uh, do I get your question? I think uh, I, you have answered the question. Uh... The next question is, what about recommending scientifically proven interventions in other parts of the world after uh, research in our community for the first time within a single research paper? Um, thank you. Again, as we said, any evidence simply means uh, a review process. So without going through a repeated 
what we need is like uh, when we get some results that there, there is a chance that that result is by coincidence, by chance. Uh, even the selected study population could have some desirable characteristics that made the intervention look favorable. So the only way to confirm that is to conduct similar study in different setups uh, and at different times so that in whenever we change the setup the, and the population dynamics and even when the time change, if the result remains the same, then we can say that it's um it's 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 fact and we can recommend otherwise we have to be very careful and i don't know maybe in some rcts in the absence of uh, for because of the lack of a beta intervention for example during covid because of the lack of a beta intervention and people were dying here and there some interventions were like applied some medications were recommended without a strong evidence and later were banned because of their bad effects, right, as you all were aware. So, so it's, we have to be very careful unless we have very limited options where uh, some interventions which are on trial level or with single studies can be attempted. Uh, otherwise, we shouldn't consider those things. Okay, the other question is... Okay. If... Okay. Can you continue, please? No, no, you can continue. Okay. Uh, would it be fair to compare your study findings with other research results obtained by another study design? Uh, thank you. Uh, it's, this is a very uh, good question, and I, I also forgot to address this. Mm -hmm. Our study design is uh, one of the things that we should uh, consider while interpreting our results, for example. Uh, the evidence that we get using a core design cannot be fairly compared with the evidence that we get with cross-sectional studies. So what we do is whenever possible, we have to select only study designs that are in line with our study design. And then we have to compare that with those designs because their baseline characteristics, their recruitment process, and everything is comparable. And it's, uh, it's uh, okay to say to compare them. But when we don't have evidence like that, we can compare them with other study designs, but we have to be careful and we have to also acknowledge that. Since there are no studies conducted uh, with similar study design, we have compared our results with these, these type of studies, which are conducted in a completely different study design, and the strength of evidence is different. Uh, different. So carefully, we can present those findings, but it's the level of confidence that we communicate our results. Uh, that gives meaning. So we don't have to be that confident when we communicate results which are conducted uh, based on different study designs. For example, when I did my master thesis, I couldn't find a prior research on my topic. So it was a survival analysis on uh, diabetic patients. I wanted to know how long does it take them to reach glycemic control, their first glycemic control. Uh, when they're like newly diagnosed and injected on treatment. So since I couldn't find any other prior research, uh, what I did was I compared them with other studies, even a completely different outcome study, like uh, studies that assessed level of glycemic control. So it can give you some perspective, but it cannot be fairly comparable. And I have acknowledged that at the beginning of my discussion section so that people can read that, uh, uh, can uh, read my discussion section uh, acknowledging that gap. Okay. Uh, the other question is, what what are points we need to consider in writing discussion and recommendation in qualitative study? Is it, is that similar with quantitative research? Mm, your connection. Uh... Is it just me or? Okay, let me, okay. can you hear me now? Can you just repeat it? Yeah. Okay. And the, the other question is, what are points we need to consider in writing a discussion and recommendation in quality, in qualitative study? Is that uh, similar with quantitative research?
I can't, uh, I think I can't hear Dr. Brook properly. I'm trying to find the question on the chat box. Um, for qualitative research, uh, can you hear me? I'm not sure if you can hear me. Brooke, no, I, can I can you hear, hear me? I can hear you. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, I think it's about qualitative research, right? Um, uh, what, uh, in qualitative if, research, if can... it's not about generalization. Okay. If you can hear me, I can repeat the question. Thank you. Okay, please do. What what are what are points we need to consider in writing discussion and recommendation in qualitative study? Is that similar with quant quantitative research? Okay, thank you. Qualitative research is actually a completely different thing. Uh, in qualitative research, what we aim to do is to understand the study population, to understand their perspective, and to explore about their attitude, their perspective about a given problem not to make generalization so it goes like a bit different uh we don't have like factors we don't have like prevalence rather we want it's like more of a narrative synthesis and it's like reading an article and summarizing it and uh, taking out the most uh, relevant uh, findings from the data collected so it's a bit different maybe if uh, that person is interested, um, you can inbox me in person and I'll be able to reach out to you. It's it's a it's a different uh, scenario. Uh, okay. And the other question is uh, the finding of new research done on a limited setting. Uh, it could be used as a recommendation for the place and time. Yeah, like I said, when we have like very limited uh, therapeutic or interventional options, and uh, if what we have currently is not doing anything good, we can we can try those things as an intervention. But even when we consider new interventions, there are a lot of ethical issues surrounding it. Even when we conduct the study, let alone when we try to apply. The, the finding. So there are a number of issues for someone to get approved to apply some new intervention. Uh, you have to go through some uh, approval process by itself. So that approval pr process requires uh, and is this uh, problem and how much are we comfortable with the results? So we can't just apply it uh, right away and uh, but if it is just um, some uh, intervention which is harmless, like health digit question, or I don't know, some using mobile application, we might consider that if we have limited options, but depending on the type of intervention that we have, we have to be careful when we recommend, uh, when we recommend uh, to apply that at a larger scale. Uh, besides the number of study population included and other study quality should also be considered. Mm. Okay. Uh, we have two more questions left. Uh, okay. One, okay. One is what if our findings estimate, uh, for instance, incidence falls within the confidence interval of a previous study, though it is higher, is that not important to take uh, confidence interval into consideration when when we compare prevalence or incidence? Thank you. This is a very important point. I did not. I just wanted to keep it simple. That's why I didn't brought it up. But yes, it's very important. That's why I even kept uh, for our outcome variable. We kept the ninety five percent confidence interval in our discussion because we want to see that. Uh, the confidence interval will tell us if our result is comparable with other results or not. Let's say if the confidence interval of our outcome or prevalence lies uh, includes the estimate or the, uh, the range of the confidence interval of another study prevalence, and we can't say that these two studies are 
similar. Yes, when we do the uh, analysis, we have considered that, we should consider that. Uh, but since it's a common train to do that, we don't write that on our uh, discussion section. But yes, whenever you pick results from another study and you compare prevalences, you have to also compare their 95% confidence intervals. If one result falls in the confidence interval of another result, then that means there is no difference in the prevalence between the two groups. Even if, let's say, in our study it's 5.3, but in another study it could be um, 6.2. But if the confidence interval overlaps, then we can say that these results are not uh, different, even if there is mathematically a clear uh, difference between the two numbers. It's a very interesting th question. Thank you for raising it. Okay, and our last question is, uh, is comparability mandatory? Yeah, thank you. Comparability, if you are talking about comparing groups, no. Comparability is mandatory when you do comparative research because when you uh, start, when you conduct case control cohort or RCT studies, what we consider intrinsically is that these groups are comparable in every aspect other than their outcome or their exposure. So unless you confirm that these groups are comparable, uh, you can't purely say that the result that you get is because of that particular exposure. Rather, it could be because of their intrinsic difference in characteristics. Uh, for example, if we are studying the prevalence of, let's say, uh, breast cancer, and if we believe, uh, if we take the exposure as uh, their gender, and if uh, we include, if if we include um, females who are, uh, I mean, males, females who are very old and males who are young, and if we compare them, and if we find that the prevalence of breast cancer is very high among females, yes, we know that prevalence of breast cancer is high, but this disproportionately very high number from what we know has happened because of additional risk factor in the female group, which is their old age. So uh, if we do comparative analysis, we will learn that to begin with, this study population are not comparable in their age, and uh, it could be based on other risk factors as well. So comparing it will give us a perspective if the two groups are fair to be compared or not. Even if they're not fair to be compared, there is nothing we can do. We will still do the, the study, but we will acknowledge that while we're discussing our results. We will say that these two groups were not comparable enough to begin with. So we have to consider that in mind when we interpret these findings. So we should consider that. I, get, I hope uh, that answers your question. Well, okay, so thank you, Dr. Egist, for this amazing presentation uh, and for taking your time to have a, to have a set series on research. Uh, as we all know, we have not been uh, given the best tools to become researchers in our educational system and thank you for being uh, one of the one of the people i look up to and want me uh, makes myself more uh, interested in research than i was a while back and thank you for this that was very nice thank you dr brooke thank you everyone um if you have any question after the post test, uh, you can post it, I guess. We'll wait for a few minutes. So if there's any concern, you can forward that to me. Thank you, everyone.